we're going to have a fascinating conversation tonight, and I want to welcome you all. I want to welcome you who are here. I want to welcome you who are online, and I want to welcome, of course, the panel uh, to this discussion. Uh, we are going to have fun, but by the same token, we're going to daylight an issue that has been nagging this city for many, many years. And I know this because first when I was the downtown planner, and then when Ann McAfee and I became the co-chief planners of Vancouver, we were constantly developing along the seawall, bringing in tens of thousands of people, and we were constantly asking the question, what should the seawall be? And we were constantly going out to the public and wondering what the seawall should be. And tonight we're gonna to get to check that a few years later to see just how public opinion has moved or not moved in all those years. In my day, the results that you see out on the seawall today, the experience that we have of it every day, uh, is unmistakably what the public told us overwhelmingly that they wanted at that time. And the question is, and it's a very serious question, is that where we all stand today? So in this Oxford-style debate, it, it's a kind of a fast-moving, uh, exciting approach. I like it because you've got to get ideas out quickly, and they get clashed with other ideas very quickly. Either you're for it, and we're going to have arguments uh, aggressively for it, or you're strongly against it. And you'll hear the arguments, and then yeah, you get to decide. You get to decide exactly whether the existing status quo is what it should be or it should be something different. And there is the resolution, commercialize the seawall. So let me offer just a little bit of a frame for this debate. Now we all know that the seawall is probably Vancouver's most beloved public space or attraction. It's where we all go. It's our alternative to the Italians' town square, where they all go in an evening and the weekends, et cetera, et cetera. What you may not know, it is the world's single longest uninterrupted waterfront path, according to the Vancouver Parks Board, extending 28 kilometers. And we all love its continuous greenway. It's great for walkers, for cyclists. Uh, it connects amazing green spaces, and it extends from the convention center right around Stanley Park, right around False Creek, uh, and right out to Spanish Banks. And we call it the string of green pearls, and it's famous all around the world. Everywhere I go to work, people want to know about Stanley Park and the seawall. That's the, a couple of the big issues they want to know about our city. I emphasize green, because right now it's almost all park-like, with very few private buildings or activities along it. Um, and where there are urban activities, they're set behind the walkway. They're not on the water side. And so the water side is basically green and pastoral. Now there are a few restaurants that you know, highlight the situation. They're truly commercial. But by and large, the seawall lacks right now, private commercial activities and facilities. And the question is, is that good or is that bad? And I think we're gonna hear both sides of the argument tonight. To the debaters, I say this. Let's get to the essential question tonight. Let's say none or lots. Let's not quibble about a few restaurants here or there or the odd little attraction, let's try to get to that hard question that has actually very much vexed this city, the city, the parks board, and many, many citizens for, for many, many years. Do we want to significantly change the character and personality of our seawall? Is that the right thing to do? Is that our, what our citizens want? How does that idea reconcile with other issues that are the imperatives of our time and are the imperatives of our city? Bottom line, is the seawall to remain a passive green experience, a respite from the frenetic city around it? Or is the seawall to become a place of commercial energy and offerings, a draw more reflective of the adjacent urban vibe. 
So that's the frame, debaters, for our evening, the pros and cons of that. And I want us to get started on that right away. Here's how the evening will go. First, you will have the opportunity to vote on the basic principle, pro or con. We will tabulate that, we'll wait for it, and then you'll be able to see what the state of public opinion is in the audience online at this very moment. To begin, each member of a two-member team will give an opening statement of seven minutes. And we're gonna be really aggressive about the seven minutes. So it's not nine minutes or 22 minutes, and we've all had those uh, places we've gone and it's turned out to be that way. No, this is gonna be seven minutes. And then we're gonna have a pause and we're gonna have a conversation. And then each debater will then have two minutes to do a closing comment. That's four two-minute segments. And after the debate is then finished, you'll be able to vote again. And the team, not the team that is more pro or con, but the team that, that changes your minds the most is the team that will win this debate. That is the classic uh, Oxford style of debate. So the issue is commercialize the seawall. Let's get going. Let's do that initial vote. Cast your vote right now. And you can do that either by going to this site and casting your vote, or if you don't want to do that, there are going to be people that will have hard balance in the audience. Uh, where are they at? Someone raise their hand. Swoop down. Come on down. Swoop down so that if one wants to vote in a hard ballot, that you can do that. So log on. What's your opinion? Let's decide. Here is the result. Commercialize the seawall. Pro, 27%. Commercialize the seawall. Con, 73%. <laughs> so there's pretty strong public opinion. There it is. So that's the start. When we're finished, we'll debate again, and we'll see if you've changed your mind. But this is the state of our community's opinion on this topic as we know it today. So now let's meet our teams. They're smart, they're knowledgeable, they're brave. So I really want to welcome the city debaters of tonight. And we all know them for all the many contributions that they have made. First, on the pro side, we have Joost Bakker and Lance Berwillowitz. Lance is a planner, an urban designer, and the principal of Urban Forum Associates. He's also the author of Dream City, Vancouver and the Global Imagination, a spectacular book about the, the quality and the nature of our city. It's an award-winning book uh, on the emerging urban form that makes us so special. And his teammate is Joost Bakker, an architect and urban designer and the founder of Dialogue. Joost has enhanced probably the most important public spaces in our city. He is uh, famous for, for doing Granville Island, Lonsdale Keys, new ship, the shipyards, and a revitalized CBC, among hundreds of an amazing projects. And so I'd like to say, come on up. Lance and Yost, join me on stage. This side. And now, against the resolution, we have David Hutch and Margot Long. Dave Hutch is a landscape architect and he's the director of the parks and uh, of planning and parks development with the Vancouver Parks Board, an amazing leader in our city today. And his teammate, Margot Long, is one of the founding principals of PWL Partnership Landscape Architects and a fellow 
of the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, another designer who has put her fingers, her hands, her, her ideas on many of the open spaces in our cities. So please welcome the cons, or I should say the con arguers, Margot Long and David Hutch. And so there we have our team, they're ready, they're geared up, you should have seen them before, they were huddled on each side, they were growling at one another, and they are ready to talk. And so without further ado, let's begin the first round, seven minutes each, and we'll begin with Lance Berwillowitz talking for the resolution. Lance, it's all up to you. Good evening. I'm here tonight to argue for the motion that Vancouver should commercialize the seawall, which wraps around our city's shoreline for more than 28 kilometers. But let's first get two misleading things out of the way right off the top. Firstly, the motion, as stated, is deliberately exaggerated, even sensationalist. And we're not here to argue for the wholesale commercialization of Vancouver's entire seawall, nor for its complete privatization for profit. We recognize that the seawall is a much loved public good and will remain so, so please keep this in mind when voting again. <laughs> Second, and this is key, Vancouver has always commercialized its public waterfront and continues to do so today. Historically, we need only look at Archival photographs, for example, this one of the public pier and bathhouse in English Bay. Or think about the numerous concession kiosks run by the Parks Board at many of the beaches. In this archival image from almost 100 years ago, note the carousel on the pier and the rental beach chairs, both highly popular and no doubt pay for use public amenities. So this is nothing new. Similarly, the presence of food concession kiosks at many of our beaches is a long-established Vancouver tradition, and these simple, modest outlets serve the needs of many people. Imagine for a moment what things would be like for people enjoying our seawall if those who are opposing the motion tonight were to get their way, <laughs> and all such commercial uses of the seawall were to disappear. Recently, we've seen a handful of more impressive commercial projects on the seawall, such as the Cactus Club in English Bay or the Boathouse Restaurant and Concession overlooking Kitts Beach. Both of these projects were strongly opposed by some folks in their respective neighborhoods, but have since become highly popular with beachgoers, seawall walkers, cyclists, and, you guessed it, local residents. And you know what? After the Kitts Beach restaurant was opened, the sky did not fall down, the neighborhood was not overrun, property values in Kitts Point did not plummet. On the contrary, the area has, if anything, become, become even more desirable, and a visit to Kitts Beach is now a better experience than ever for all. And here's another thing. Please note how our Parks Board, represented here this evening by my esteemed colleague on the other team opposing the debate motion, happily imposes a commercial cost on all those using the seawall who happen to arrive by car. Isn't that interesting? Oppose commercializing the seawall indeed. Ah. So why this debate motion? Well, I suspect that the organizers of this debate recognize that compared to many other waterfront cities around the world, Vancouver's urban waterfront is an underperforming, underdesigned, and underserved part of our public realm. It is, frankly, an uninspiring and underwhelming urban environment, supporting a very limited range of public uses and activities. 
Now consider some images from a few other waterfront cities. For example, Barcelona, Cape Town, Sydney, Tel Aviv. These diverse waterfront cities and so many more like them offer us tantalizing hints of what is possible here in Vancouver. As these few examples illustrate, our seawall could be so much more diverse, interesting, exciting, and we deserve so much more. We should be demanding much more while preserving and nurturing the best of our natural waterfront environment. And these two things are not mutually exclusive. So what's the alternative? As I said, of course, we are not arguing for full-scale commercialization across the seawall along its entire length, nor for its privatization for profit. Rather, I am saying we can and should provide a wider range of commercial amenities and services at key nodes along the seawall where there is a clear public need and demand, and where their introduction would complement, not compete with, the natural environment. We could identify many of these underused areas along the seawall that could be enhanced by commercial uses. This slide, for example, shows just a handful of such underused empty spaces currently. And here are a few images of potential transformations. This one, this one, and this one. Imagine, imagine the range of uses we could add, such as food and drink outlets, oyster and champagne bars, ice cream kiosks, farmers markers, and rentals of beach chairs, yoga mats, beach equipment, paddle boards, boats, windsurf boards, kites, kites, bicycles, and so on. Anything and everything that humans seek out for a day at the beachfront. There is another key advantage of more small-scale, incremental commercial facilities along the seawall. They can be owned and operated by many local entrepreneurs and small business people, creating new jobs and also adding new taxes to the city's coffers. And this revenue can, in turn, be put towards enhancing and protecting our urban shoreline, vulnerable as it is to rising sea levels in a world of changing climate. In other words, more local business operators would benefit from an enhanced seawall, thus spreading the economic benefits around supporting economic equity and building social sustainability. And lest our esteemed opponents tonight might attempt to argue that the seawall is an untouched, pristine, immutable natural environment and should remain so forever, the fact is that Vancouver's waterfront has always undergone change and is a highly constructed, carefully calibrated public space, as my debate partner Joost will describe more fully in his presentation. So, in conclusion, Larry, I think it is obvious that our current seawall, with a very few notable exceptions, is the very definition of an inflexible, limiting, and uninspiring space, which furthermore restricts public activities to a highly controlled, narrow range of uses that are frankly determined by a small and unaccountable bureaucracy. I hope that you will agree that there is ample precedent, plenty of space, and a compelling public interest to add more commercial amenities and services to our beloved seawall and thus liberate it from the straight jacket it and I find ourselves in. Just imagine the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a beautiful image and wonderful words, but Dave, come and tell us your side. Dave Hutch. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Larry, and good evening, everyone. Um, before starting, I wanted to acknowledge that the seawall is a settler structure on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and the debate tonight is really focused on that colonial relationship to the land and the water, which is really an infinitesimal small amount of time compared to time immemorial in which um, local nations have uh, have been living here. So we have much to learn from local nations uh, when we talk about reimagining the seawall tonight. So uh, here's my clicker. Uh, so we're, I'm going to start up the debate tonight. I want to take you on a journey. We're going to head down to the seawall. Whoops, next one. We're going to head down to the seawall. And to prepare us for this journey, I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Imagine your favorite spot on the seawall. You got it? 
Maybe you're walking or rolling. Maybe you're riding a bike. You can open your eyes now. Let's take a deep breath. It's a gorgeous sunny day. The tide's gone out a bit. You can smell the fresh salty ocean air. You can hear sounds of waves lapping on the rocks. You can feel the cool breeze. Take another deep breath. You start to relax. Your mind starts to clear. You're getting that wakeful relaxation that only happens in the rarest moments of tranquility and calmness. Your brain's alpha waves begin to flow undistracted. Take another breath. You find a clarity of mind is coming to you. That difficult decision suddenly has clear direction. Perhaps a creative spark is suddenly firing. Or maybe it's just a deep feeling of calmness and connectedness to place, a sense that it's all going to be okay. So why is this happening? It's because we are immersed in nature, free from distractions, surrounded by water, a park, a beach, that magical space between land and water. There's an energy here we can't really describe. So how do you feel now? Replenished? Restored? Relaxed? Maybe nourished? So why did I take you on that journey? Because there's another journey along the waterfront, one that's full of distraction, a waterfront filled with commercialization, shop services, restaurants, and many other things. It's safe to say that many of us have traveled to West Coast cities, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, and their waterfronts are not like ours. Here's San Francisco. Again, here's Seattle. We know how we're bombarded in almost every minute of our day-to-day -day life with distractions. We know if we don't have distractions around us, we can just reach in our pocket and start flipping through our, fav our favorite mind-wasting app. Cities are places to be energized, of course, but our city is one of the most sought-after places to live and visit in the world. It's a place to be energized and a rare place also to experience nature and where we experience creativity, rest, and wellness. So why does this matter to the seawall? Because I'm arguing that commercialization of the seawall and waterfront parks is just another form of distraction <clears throat> in our day-to-day -day lives, impacting our power to think, solve problems, connect with others, and stifling our creativity. So given this expansive nature of the seawall, is the seawall and the city's waterfront a canvas in which we can create? What do I mean? Well, let's look at a recent occurrence, barge chilling beach. <laughs> the simple arrival of a barge washing up in a storm has inspired a plethora of creativity. It's also become the muse for so many creative riffs. Another example, last summer's pop-up plaza at Sunset Beach became a tableau for a myriad activities, a simple blank canvas to which so many were drawn to express themselves, to be seen, to see, to be with others. But let's get back to commercialization because that's the other team's goal, right? So what are the foundations of commercialization? Something to buy, something to do, to be entertained? All of these things are essential components of a city and add to the vibrancy and fun of urban living, but do we need to have them at our fingertips everywhere we go in the city? <clears throat> and in a city that's only devoted 11% of its land area to parks, the lowest provision of all major Canadian cities, is making space for commercialization the best use of a scarce and highly sought after park space and waterfront? Now that you think uh, Margo and I are just big green hippies, uh, let's have a little discussion about economics. There's another side to commercialization. It generates revenues, it drives the economy, it means jobs, taxes get paid that supports all sorts of great things, right? So here's the thing. The seawall does some heavy lifting when it comes to driving Vancouver's economy in a way you may not have noticed. You see, the seawall is so integrally woven into brand Vancouver that, in fact, the seawall plays a foundational role in Vancouver's economy. So let's have a look. 
So TripAdvisor, we all know, one of the world's most popular crowdsourced resource for travel planning. What's TripAdvisor saying? Number one thing to do in Vancouver, Stanley Park. Number one thing to do in Stanley Park, the seawall. The seawall is number three of 424 things to do in Vancouver. What's Destination Vancouver saying? It's spring on the seawall. Let's plan our activity with Destination Vancouver. Restaurants, places to stay, careers, what do they all have in common? The seawall is in every image. <laughs> Destination Canada, the federal government's portal to the international visitors. So that one's fairly obvious. What is the cruise ship industry saying about Vancouver? Vibrant Vancouver, Princess Cruises, an outdoor playground teeming with adventure and awe. Even the breweries have caught on. <laughs> I want to argue that it's this very contrast of city and nature, a bustling, gleaming modern city, all steps away from ocean, ocean and forest. This magic spot between land and water, the space of the seawall, waterfront parks and beaches, that drives the identity of Vancouver as a lifestyle destination. The very reason people are compelled to move here, to visit here, to work here, is in fact the seawall, not commercialization but I don't want to end on economics. <laughs> Let's go back to the place where we started, your favorite spot on the seawall. The sun setting is setting. Maybe it's a brilliant bluebird day, or perhaps it's raining. You're surrounded by nature, forest blue and green. Close your eyes again, find your spot, take a deep breath. I hope you're feeling restored. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Yoast. Now it's your turn. Yoast Bakker. Good evening, everybody. And uh, Dave, lovely seductive slides. <laughs> it's valuable to have a park sports slideshow. Um, like Vance, uh, my position uh, is as well to simply say that this Seawall and the water's edge have always been commercialized and that we need substantial revitalization going forward. Thich Nhat Hanh passed away this January. He was a man of many memorable quotes. This one on impermanence seems very relevant when thinking about the seawall and the waterfront over time. Whoops, don't forget the slides, Yost. Uh, the word seawall evokes a sense of solidity and protection. Jimmy Cunningham, Master uh, Mason, started building the wall in 1913. It was finally completed in 1980. Looking through time, it's important to ask the question, is the seawall a beloved public realm success story or not? Where does the word commercialize come from? Its Latin roots focus on calm, together, and merce exchange. This reading takes me to a place that suggests that our water's edge it has, in fact, always been a place of commerce, a place of exchange, a place of living together. This understanding is particularly relevant in light of our current pressing issues around reconciliation and climate change. At English Bay, commercial activity is always visible. Hop on electrical scooters are now commercially for rent. It's hard to tell if this man on the cell phone on the park bench is competing commercially for a lucrative Bitcoin deal or a very expensive long distance uh, phone call home. Equally interesting is that these welcome and well used park benches are a commercial undertaking by the Parks Board. Through its bench dedication initiative, you can dedicate a bench for 10 years at the cost of $7,500. As Lance has also clearly shown, the seawall from Coal Harbor to Spanish Banks has many places of exchange and commercial benefit, ranging from whole neighborhoods, be the English Bay, Olympic Village, Kitts Beach, or uh, the numerous private restaurants and hot dog stands. Food trucks at Spanish banks, annual folk festivals at Jericho, the Cirque du Soleil, productions in False Creek, and even the sale of paintings near Stanley Park commercialize and animate our public life along the waterfront. In the 1850s and prior to the arrival of us settlers, the ocean's natural edge and extensive intertidal zone served as both home, as sustenance, and as place of exchange for the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh the villages of Chate Tooth and Woiwoi mapped here were but only the early 
settlements on uh, this land. Many more villages stretched from here along English Bay through Falls Creek, including Sanok, and out to those uh, at Jericho Beach. Coming across these particular early photos was shocking. At the turn of the century, our indigenous communities in Vancouver were aggressively pushed and forced to leave these extensive tidal areas to make way for colonial settlement. On the bottom right is the forced removal of Squamish communities uh, from the tidal flats over two days in 1913. On the left is the digging up of the midden at Woi Woi to build the beginning of our colonial public realm in the Stanley Park Road. Shahunts at Brockton Point is still here, seen in 1931. The building of the seawall sea was also damaging and diminished the rich intertidal zone. As this diagram indicates, the intertidal zone and its marine life gets lowered by wave action and erosion into the ocean. I arrived in Vancouver in 74 in the twilight of the resource extraction industry. The water's edge and Coal Harbor and Falls Creek were heavily commercialized for industrial purposes. Here we see Vancouver in the early 70s overlooking Granville Island. In fact, the island itself was built on an intertidal mudflat previously used for fishing. Both Falls Creek and Coal Harbor were surrounded with extensive industrial zoning. These industrial lands became enormous commercial opportunities uh, for many residential developers and eventual homeowners. Starting in the mid-70s, Falls Creek's transformation escalated, into Expo, escalated after Expo 86. Residents along the North Shore were enormously benefited from the seawall. Granville Island in the foreground uh, was consciously commercialized to create an active place of exchange on the waterfront. In 2022, we've all witnessed the violence of climate change with its high tides storms that have struck an enormous blow along the 28 kilometers. The full length from Stanley Park to Spanish Bank has been impacted. The damage is currently visible wherever we walk or bike. Access is blocked in many locations. Headlines, public statements, and social media uh, point to the need for new thinking about the seawall. As this one banner states, the seawall's future is unclear post-storm. There is a pressing need to find a new long-term solutions working with stakeholders and First Nations to address our relationship to water and our shoreline. Substantial resources will be needed. One uh, study has suggested that raising the seawall in False Creek by an average of 2.3 meters could cost us between 500 million or $850 million. A very important uh, sea to city study is currently underway in False Creek. Local and international teams are studying sea level rise and how we might look differently at connecting to our water edges. How might we make uh, more spongy edges and healthy intertidal zones? Are there, mature base, are there nature based solutions? And can we move from seawalls to floating sea walks to provide protection? In 2020, we at Dialogue also sponsored a week long residency with students from across Canada and the US to reimagine English Bay to see how we might more meaningfully engage with the water itself and tidal and ecological dimensions. Massive and necessary new commercial revitalization and reconciliation is also underway along our water's edge, working with First Nations. The new village of Sanak is being reconceived on its original traditional lands. It will commercialize some 6,000 new affordable homes next to Falls Creek. It is envisioned to generate between 16 billion and 20 billion of rental income throughout its lifespan. A revisioning of the Jericho lands is also, as we know, currently underway. We have no choice but to work together creatively to address our ever-changing and impermanent waterfront. As I have stated at the beginning, it will require substantial commercial revitalization and exchange of resources publicly and privately to restore our shoreline and Larry is approaching, and successfully address both climate change and reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Yost. Margot, Margot Long, it's now your turn. Wow, hard to follow. Mine's going to be much more homegrown, um, because I did it myself, but that's OK. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Okay, today the Vancouver seawall is the edge between water and land and it is incredibly meaningful, 
important and cultural for Vancouver and all the peoples that came before us here in the audience. From the beginning, the space between the water's edge and the land has been ecologically and environmentally vital and incredibly cultural for the First Peoples. They had names for all of these places along the edge of the land and water. Names like Laklaki, Squat Chichi, Stake Wak, and I apologize if I completely brutalize those names. These were sacred and special places, not names like the Cactus Club, Hard Rock Casino, Stanley Park Brewery, <laughs> Falls Creek Marina or Joe's Roller Derby. The interface between the land and water was originally and truly on, only understood by the first peoples of this territory. And I would argue that these names and the environmental importance is more critical now than ever. Then over time, as many of my um, colleagues have already mentioned, um, it, we colonized and the city grew. And long before the seawall was, was built, People wanted to get out of the city and connect to the edge of the land and water, away from the hustle and bustle. And 110 years later, and 40 years after the seawall was completed, people still want to get close to the edge, close to nature, but still be in the city. This has become even more critical and important through the pandemic, being outside and away from commercialization. We need space on the edge of our land and water. This space is called the seawall. People come to the seawall to recreate and to get away from commercialization. Have we not learned anything from the pandemic that we need space outside to gather safely? If there is another outbreak or another pandemic, which the experts say is inevitable, we need the seawall and the space around the seawall, not more commercialized enterprises. The experts also say that being in the city and connected to commercialization um, all the time is not healthy. Sustained noise for eight hours at 85 decimals is dangerous according to the CDC and the WHO. City background noise levels average about 60 to 75 decimals, which is loud enough to raise one's blood pressure and heart rate, cause stress, loss of concentration, cause depression, and loss of sleep. A park, on the other hand, is around 40 decimals, much healthier than the 85 decimals of a commercialized restaurant. Studies show that people live near the water, have a lower risk of premature death, uh, lower risk of, uh, risk of obesity, and generally report better mental health and well-being. Water has a psychologically restorative effect on people. These blue-green health studies are well documented, so again, I would argue for the health of our city and the people, keep the commercialization off the seawall. If these spaces are filled with commercial ventures, the seawall becomes less public and begins to only provide places for those who, who are privileged. And those who have less money, are marginalized and feel left out, might potentially feel less comfortable on the seawall. And I guess I ask you exactly where are you going to put any more commercialization? Where will it even fit? I ask my fine appoint, uh, opponents here. Um, <laughs> as you can see, the city already is encroaching onto the important edge of, the, of water and land, this edge that needs preserved for nature and people. And you can also see from this image the importance of the seawall on the edge and not having the city move more towards it. Nothing larger than a food truck should be introduced next to the seawall. And maybe this is the only commercialization that should be found anywhere near it. The seawall needs to be truly public. We need all kinds of people on the, in our public spaces, not just the ones who can afford to pay for it. We don't need another sports arena or roller coaster to animate our seawall. There is enough animation to go around and around. So many of the city policies address um, city making and healthy cities. Nick Page of the Vancouver Parks Board said that um, the more urban we get, the more people support and are captivated by what we have left. Part of our role is to ask how we can better connect people with nature. How can we make it so that nature is something we see in our city? How can urban design directions over the past 50 years be so wrong 
the City of Vancouver Planning Direction established critical street end views to the water and mountains beyond, reinforcing the connection of land and water and our innate desire to be close to the water. This is not only reflected in the uh, preserved view corridors, but in major redevelopment of Vancouver waterfronts during the reign of Ray Spaxman, Larry Beasley, and Brent Totterin, they kept buildings out of the street ends and that ended in the water. And please remember that, Mr. Moderator, when you're counting the votes. <laughs> so building on that, why would any sane urban designer, architect, landscape architect, developer, city planner, mayor, or councillor want to commercialize this, or this, or this, or this? And in closing, I will let the people speak. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Margot. Those uh, all four were very, very compelling arguments. Don't you think? Don't you think that was interesting? So I just want to go to the pros and, and ask a very simple question. How do we avoid the seawall if we do take advantage of some of the interesting opportunities that you both discussed, how do we avoid it turning it into the Tivoli Gardens Carney of Vancouver if we add all that commerce? Well, um, yeah. No, sorry. No, I, I, I uh, like, I, I'm not sure that we Carney to occur, and I think uh, our competitors were suggesting that commercialization means distraction. I think what we're talking about is a lot of natural settings, but a real important necessary change that will be imposed on us. And how do we do it in an interesting, creative, uh, regenerative way that benefits future generations? And the costs that are upon us for the damage that's being done to us is staggering. So I think we need to have a much bigger vision rather than deciding whether there's a few distracting entertainments along the seawall. So th that's, that's certainly where I think Great. I'm coming Thank from. You. And I think, uh, I agree. Yep. I agree. Is there a question out there in the audience? Is there a question? All right, there is an online question. Let's see if I can read it here. My one concern is commercializing the seawall will result in a loss of democratic space. How are you able to address my concerns, a democratic space advocate of maintaining such a rich diversity at the seawall while also commercializing the heart of our city? Maybe I can take a crack at that. I think that's for the pro side. I would say um, it might be. Yes, so, so um, there's so many ways to answer that, but the one that comes to mind for me is think about the great uh, democratic, historically democratic places in the world, whether that's the piazzas of Italy or the agoras of Greece, these places were both public open spaces, uh, advocate for democracy, as I am too, uh, and also places of exchange, of commercial exchange. And so there's a classic, those are classic examples that I can think of off the top of my head. And of course, there are many, many other cities in addition to the ones that I showed you slides of where there is a balance of both of those things. And I don't think, I think it's, it's not an either or, it's, that's a false dichotomy in my view. I think we can both preserve the best of nature while recognizing that Vancouver's seawall is in fact an artificial construct uh, created physically by human beings over hundreds of years, whilst also um, enhancing it and energizing it so that in fact it becomes perhaps even more democratic in the sense that I described in my opening remarks where it creates opportunities for small scale business owners and operators to come in and also create work and create um, income for themselves and workers and taxes to help pay for all those big ticket items that Joost has mentioned. Great, thank you for that. I see a question from the audience, let's go there. Um, hello there, folks. Um, I was wondering, both sides use this notion of 
indigenous histories on this land prior, um, this concept of reconciliation, to justify arguments on both ends. Um, and I was just curious what uh, consultation um, folks had with indigenous groups or communities uh, to reach those conclusions for both sides. Well, let's start over with the cons side. To for answer sure, that I, can, question. Uh, I can take that on. Um, so uh, the Park Board has a Stanley Park Intergovernmental Working Group, so we work government to government with the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil on a consensus-based approach to the planning within Stanley Park, and we are extending that work to our other waterfront parks in the city, collaborating with the host nations in changes that we make uh, in the parks. And it's, uh, it's a process of, of learning and, um, and basically how do we express decolonization, reconciliation on the land and in the waterfront. Great, thank you. I want to I want to put a hard question to you as I I'll come back to you in just a second as I as I um, at, to you in the same way I did to the other group. Is the seawall boring now? Is the seawall passe? Is the seawall something that maybe my generation found interesting, but people who are 20 years old in this room might not find interesting? And then Yost, I'll come back to you. Well, the data tells us absolutely not. You know, okay. We're collecting data on the amount of people, and we have seen an incredible increase. As Margot noted, during the pandemic, people sought refuge in our parks, beaches, and seawalls. So we've seen an incredible increase. And I think we've actually got some new customers that are coming because they're not able to travel and, and do some of those other things, particularly in lockdown. So no, I think the seawall is even more relevant today than it was in the past. And I, I would say that the, um, the people here tonight have with their votes basically, you know, put their position forward. Okay. Uh, that's one position. With their first vote. With, with their, their first, first vote. vote. That's right. Yes. Yost, over to you. I was gonna say, I, I, I don't mind being an underdog, but no, I wanted to get back <laughs> to the question that came from the audience. Yes. Uh, I think uh, all of us, um, and depending on the fields obviously that we're in, are very much immersed in working with uh, First Nations and uh, my firm's been involved in the rezoning of the Heatherlands, which is owned jointly by Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil We've been working directly with cultural liaisons. They've been engaging us in understanding the stories of the place. They've been working with us in developing the landscape treatment, the design guidelines for buildings. So the relationship is really growing uh, as well. I know in multiple groups, and certainly in our firm, we've worked with a, a group called Sky Spirit, who has... Uh, a whole decolonization uh, program, uh, which are two major uh, uh, workshops in trying to understand and even understand the words we use and how disrespectful they are. So it's, it's incredibly tough, it's really hard, but I can say I think it's enormously important and I think there's an intelligence there that we can actually benefit from as we move forward. That's right. Now let's take that lens and let's come back to the issue of this debate, commercialization. What would that lens tell you about commercialization from where we are today to where it might be, given some of the images that were just shown to us? I'll start with Dave and then I'll come to Yost. So I actually want to acknowledge Yost's um, comment that we are under an extreme slow moving threat and catastrophe of climate change. You know, we saw the storms in November, the atmospheric rivers January 7th, this, the tidal surge, and thank you for showing all those great slides from my presentation to the board. Um, <laughs> um, but where I think we differ is, I believe in, in my argument, is that the seawall, this incredible contrast between nature and city is actually the essence, that identity of brand Vancouver as a lifestyle destination, and that drives the economy. And, and you know, I wanted to dive into sort of tourism dollars and maybe try to do a, a desktop review of like how much of the tourism dollars are a result of Vancouver's brand. But all that injects money into the economy, makes us a very desirable destination um, from all sorts of, of um, sectors of the world. So. I think by preserving and enhancing and keeping an, a natural state against that contrast is only gonna make us more desirable and retaining 
people like knowledge-based workers and people moving to the city um, to keep our economy moving. Thank you, Joost. Yeah, no, I, I think partly uh, what I was attempting to do was to break open uh, the word uh, commercialization. I think in the debate it's, it's much too limited a frame. Whoops. It's much too limited a, a frame that we've defined uh, for the seawall. And, you know, is it distracting? Is it peaceful? Does it bring in tourist dollars? I, I don't think anything that's been suggested by us would diminish the enormous tourism dollars that uh, I know we rely on. I'm just saying the construct uh, philosophically and physically of the seawall is wrong, period and that I think we can actually generate something that would draw even more people to this city if done right and with a certain amount of imagination and respect of landscape, of original peoples, and the whole community. I, I would like to point out that the Oxford Dictionary, and we are in an Oxford model tonight, says that commercialization is uh, for profit and not necessarily in a positive way. And I would respond to say that, if, as I said, if you dig into the Latin roots of the word, that's wrong, okay? And the second thing is, I'm Dutch, so I'm really uncomfortable in this Oxford model. <laughs> <laughs> and I see Lance trying to get in here. Well, to I, I just wanted to thank Dave Hutch, because I think he's, in a way, inadvertently making my argument, which is, <laughs> if it's so good I, and it's so attractive for tourists and so on, why not do even better? Why not, to use your and my word, enhance the experience while also making it more available with even more rich opportunities, and I use the, rich, the term rich not in a wealth sense, but in an experiential sense, uh, for everybody. And so I think what's important is to remember the key points that both Joost and I made, which is not wholesale commercialization of the entire seawall for profit, um, but in fact an enhancement of what is, after all, Vancouver's most vital public open space, and is the equivalent of the agoras Space. of Greece. Yeah, the agoras of Greece or the piazzas of Italy. I see Dave is anxious to respond. There's lots to unpack there. I think, um, you know, my 11% number, right? We've 11% of the city is park space. Almost 30% is street and roads. Um, and then somewhere between 50 and 60% private land. Where are we going to take some more space from? That 11%? So that is one very raw, fact that we, we have to deal with. I think um, the, I'm going to let Margo. Go no, I was just yeah. going to say, wh wh where are we going to put the millions of more people that are coming? I mean, they're, they're, if we take more space away from the seawall for commercialization, then we have less potential park space and space for people to go to. I mean, there is a huge, I think that there's a huge issue and dilemma here that we, we don't have enough open space. I so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pause and I want to see where our audience wants to take this conversation. The gentleman there and then the gentleman in in blue green sweater here. First this gentleman. Um hi. Thank you for uh yeah, I mean having me but also having this debate open. Um I appreciate that. Um my heart is kind of racing cuz I'm not sure how it's going to be uh accepted or not accepted. I wanted to start off with a small comment and then I do have a question for all four of you. The, que the, the comment was on that both of the pro uh, speakers uh, started off with saying that uh, the seawall has been around for a while and, 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 and commercialization of the seawall has been around for a while and then used has uh, provided a quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, a Buddhist monk who uh, it's talking about impermanence and permanence, and I just found that a bit ironic because you're critiquing Dave and that side uh, on that their attachment to something that... Anyway, I just wanted you to also know that your side is also attached to the idea that commercialization is part of Seawall, and maybe that's something your side should look at. But uh, the question is, um, early, again, used because you did mention uh, the indigenous community, and the forcing out that happened uh, prior to the construction of the seawall. And this is a question for all of you. How does the commercialization of the seawall not only reconcile and empower the living indigenous communities, but also empower and encourage the existing local residents, uh, such as myself and my family, and not only for them to stay, but also survive, invest, and, and belong in a the city that is Vancouver, because I feel like a lot of us are being pushed out because of commercialization. Um, 
And commercialization will ultimately drive tourism, as we're talking about it, and that will drive uh, airplane uh, pollution, and that drives CO2 emissions, and that drives the sea level rise, which will mean that we don't have uh, seawall in 80 years. And you guys also mentioned that local businesses is best interest in uh, the seawall, but I don't think local businesses think in 80 year terms. And so I also want you to challenge that idea that I, I don't think it is in the best interest of local businesses to think for the sea, the health of the seawall. So a lot of thoughts there, but uh, thank you for your time. Wants to, uh, who would like to tackle that first? I'm going to go to the pro side or the, the pro side. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was a lot in there, and I thank, I thank the gentleman for his, his, his thoughtful comments. Um, I, I, you know, I come back to, if, if we've got a good thing, why can't it be better? And I also come back to recognizing that if Vancouver has aspirations to be a really fabulous, wonderful, creative city, and attracting the creative people around the world, as we do, then why is, in fact, our sea will so, to use your word, boring along large lengths of its, of its circumference. And I, I think that is, you know, jokes aside, I think that is a legitimate question to ask. And I know when I have visitors, just anecdotally speaking for myself, visitors from overseas coming here, as we do, uh, they kind of get it, and then after a while they go say, why is it always the same? Why is there all this stuff that's the same over and over again? Like, where can I go and have a good coffee? Or where can I get an ice cream? Or where can I have a you know, plate of oysters or whatever it might be. And, you know, to, to Dave's point about the 11%, my question back to him would be, how much of that 11% park space is bare, empty asphalt? And as you saw on at least one or two of my slides, my answer would be too much. Now let's go to the other side. Who's going to start on that side? I can start and then I'll, I'll let... Margaret, go. you know, I think this idea around businesses, food and beverage, right? It's an essential part of an outdoor experience, right? We spend more than probably two hours in a park. We're probably looking for a snack or a drink and definitely a place to go to the bathroom. Um, so I think of some of the wonderful high streets like Denman and Davey that really serve the, the streets of the West End and that wonderful texture of the shops along there that have all the takeout, the ice cream, the coffee that you're talking about. And I think of the redevelopment of Northeast Falls Creek and how could we create that kind of texture just back of that 11%. Um, and, I'll, and I'll address your uh, asphalt question in a second. Um, so that, and, and places like U Street and Cornwall where we have those lovely um, those <coughs> shops that really serve that beach experience. So how can we recreate that? And uh, you know, the Olympic Village to some degree, but, um, you know, how can we create that in, in some of the new waterfront spaces? I'm going to agree with you. I think we have to really look hard at things like parking and, um, and the use of hard surfaces along our waterfront. You know, we have to think of people with mobility needs and uh, th those types of things. But at the same time, you know, they're really pri privileging um, people who have the ability uh, to own a car in the city. So I, I'll agree with you on that one. Okay, yes, yes. So I just wanted to, to go back to your, whoops, I just love sitting back, but no. Um, no, I just wanted to get back to the multiple uh, threads that you were raising in your uh, question from the audience. And uh, I know in uh, my presentation, I was trying to frame uh, the shoreline in part, uh, obviously in conjunction with uh, reconciliation issues and uh, with climate change. but. I think, obviously, if we had been given 14 minutes instead of seven minutes, we might have also addressed the issue of affordability, because that actually is a major, major tidal wave coming from within the city itself that we need to uh, address. And um, I think that um, that's a tough, it's a really, really tough, tough nut to crack. I don't know how we're going to do it, but, it, but it's hugely important. Um, what I would say is in part, um, and, and again, I mean, the city will continue to grow uh, for sure. I think, uh, and I know you're doing some West End uh, planning. Uh, the, the, the residency that I sort of referred to that we did at Dialogue actually was trying to claim streets back and create 
more and more space and rely on, you know, we had wonderful plans for a streetcar in this town. We could totally change traffic and open up more space. So, like, I'm arguing that there's a lot of thinking collectively that we need to do, not only the Parks Board, but the city and all of us, on how we're going to achieve these things. And I'm saying this is a hugely important moment in time for us to do it. And so the last word from this gentleman's question I'm going to give to Margot. I'm going to focus your question a bit, as I heard it. Is commercialization pushing people out as much as pulling people in? That's what I'm heard, I heard you say in part. Margot, do you want to speak to that? Um, sure. I mean, I, I guess I would also like to ask Lance, what part of the seawall is actually boring? Because I haven't found a boring part yet. But. Um, uh, <laughs> I will say that um, I do, uh, I have a lot of family and friends that live in the West End and so I spend a lot of time on the seawall. And um, I, I think what's magical about it is that um, it, it seems like everybody feels really comfortable there. I mean, this is just my perception. It's not perfect. Um, the trash cans need to be emptied more, by the way, Dave. Um, <laughs> but, but <laughs> But it is, there's a, you know, it's, it's, it, it's almost like a snapshot back in time. And, it, and I think there's a, a, a charm about it. So some of, I think, change is inevitable. Um, commercialization will come. I, I think there is some things that just don't always need to change. And in the future, and if you look at, the, we need to look at the big picture, is there needs to be things that aren't always fixed and designed and committed to right now. There needs to be that buffer, that flex space that's not all decided. Thank you. Let's go for our last question to the person there with the green sweater. Um, so my question is actually comes from the uh, heat wave that we had last year. And I'm wondering if anybody can speak to the value of the seawall and the areas adjacent as cool wells, meaning as spaces that are preserved as shared, shaded green spaces that are a few degrees cooler. Um, Harbor Green Park was noticeably a few degrees cooler than anywhere else that I had been at that point. And I, I would be really concerned that commercialization would take away that opportunity for having those, those protected areas. And more broadly, how commercialization might um, take away opportunities for habitat restoration and other functions that park lands can have. So I'm going to start with Dave. I saw your hand up and then I'll come over here for an equal time. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. I think this is such an, uh, an imperative we need to speak about. If we would have had a uh, hydro and electrical outage or failure of significant size during the heat dome, the, the number of deaths would have been astronomical. So where were people in the heat dome that didn't have um, air conditioning or places to go? They were under trees in parks, they were on our beaches, they were at our swimming pools. We turned on the sprinklers in sports fields midday to allow people to cool off. And um, all of those things rely on something, and this is a connection that we're losing in Vancouver, soil. This is disappearing in front of us every day by the truckload, by the thousands of truckloads, soil that can grow trees. And when I mean trees, I mean big trees, not trees on top of parking structures and, and buildings. So this is one thing as we move forward is preserving soil in the city so we can grow large trees that can shade us, that can shade our buildings, that can be places of refuge as we get increasing heat um, and, and these types of events. So uh, thank you so much for raising that issue. The pros, do you have a comment? Well, far be it from me to argue the point that you know, the, the, the heat wave that we had was, was very real and, and, and very dramatic for, sadly, very far too many people. Um, nothing that I've argued on behalf of the motion this evening precludes the waterfront, the beaches, the parks from being cooling places. In fact, some of the types of commercial activities that I envisage incremental, small-scale commercial activities. Uh, I have seen in cities like Barcelona and Sydney in particular, which have much warmer climates than we do, and they use 
design, whether it's fabrics or landscaping or even hardscaping in some cases, shading systems, to help with cooling and with shading. So I don't think it's an either or. I think the point is very well made by the person asking the question. And I would argue that we need to simply free our designers to be allowed to think through creatively some of the technical solutions as well as the natural solutions. Because if we just rely on nature, we know we can't depend on her because she's unpredictable and she'll do what she wants to do regardless of what humans do or think that nature is going to do. So I do think we need to be much more thoughtful and creative and big picture thinking as Joost um, suggests about how we address these uh, looming crises that are coming towards us. So thank you for your comment. And I think Joost, do you want no, to no, continue? I just, uh, again, I, I totally support what was said and the importance of habitat restoration. Partly what I was trying to argue is how the seawall in fact has diminished uh, some of the tidal uh, world that was around us. And I, I would encourage everyone who's interested to try and keep an eye and follow the link on this uh, sea to city study that is occurring in False Creek. And some of the first reports I'm hearing is people are really looking for really creative, different, restorative ways of addressing, uh, in this instance, uh, sea level rise. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, some really positive uh, ideas uh, come uh, from that. The only other thing would be that I think we need more of is maybe places like in uh, Oslo where I can just ride my bike to the waterfront, have a drink, change, go into the sauna, dive in the water, put my clothes back on and take off. The in the winter, we need to become more creative on how we address the water. And partly what I was arguing, we need to be a lot more creative on how we can interface uh, with the water and get closer to it as we design a brand new uh, restorative uh, waterfront. Margot, a last word before we close this session. Um, I, I think I'll save mine for the closing statement. All right. Uh, Thanks. Any other last words? Well, I, I, go, go ahead. I was going to say, I wanted to thank Yoast actually for showing the diagram of the impacts of the seawall. What the seawall has done is frozen erosion in time mm -hmm. and has not allowed that natural process of cliff erosion uh, sediment and beach nourishment and so on the January 7th storm we had incredible loss of beach and we still have to figure out you know how we're going to restore those sands to those areas so we really need to understand those natural processes on that so thanks for showing that Ghost. So that is the end of our session we've spent about 20 minutes trying to unpack this issue get under this issue I've really appreciated that the the team both sides have gone to some of the other very important issues of our time that, are, that really have to be dealt with. And they've shown how this simple judgment, commercialization or not commercialization of the seawall, has something to do with indigeneity. It has something to do with climate change. It has something to do with affordable housing and, and, and whether people feel comfortable or uncomfortable in the place. It's a very important issue. And I really thank you all for a good discussion about that. And to the audience and those online, thank you for your questions. Thank you, Larry, and thank you to my esteemed colleagues, and I mean that sincerely. Um, we've heard the case that our opponents have made against commercializing the seawall tonight. And frankly, with all due respect, I believe that the arguments are self-serving and unconvincing. I suggest to you that the questions before us tonight are actually quite simple. What kind of city do we want Vancouver to be in the 21st century? What kind of public realm do we want to experience along our extensive urban waterfront? And thirdly, what kinds of amenities and services, services are most desirable to serve the many people who use and enjoy and benefit from the seawall? I know what my answer is, and we also know how so many other cities have answered these questions so much more eloquently and imaginatively that we, than we have so far, with a much wider range of amenities and services along their urban waterfronts. So what is holding us back? Well, I suspect that for one thing, some people, as we've heard this evening, are afraid of the phrase that was selected for tonight's debate motion. The word commercialize is scary for some people. But as I hope we have demonstrated, Vancouver has always had commercial uses along the seawall, and these serve a real public need, 
We need more, even as the city grows. And for another thing, Vancouver in general has a certain smugness about our surrounding spectacular natural setting, which oftentimes translates into a fear of change, lest we diminish it. But, as I've argued tonight, Vancouver's urban waterfront is highly calibrated, urban, urban construct, not an idyllic, untouched, natural environment. And furthermore, it has always undergone change. So for all the reasons that my colleague and I have outlined tonight, <laughs> we are convinced that the hands-off approach to Vancouver's cherished seawall must end, and soon. I trust you will agree with us. Thank you. Dave, over to you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I didn't prepare a statement because I wanted to hear uh, what people said tonight, and maybe I'll just take people back to this way of thinking about the, this incredible natural setting that Vancouver sits in and, and the seawall, and it really how it drives the identity of what Vancouver is for people and, and, and this idea that it's a lifestyle destination. Um, and I think we can't underestimate that, that incredible contrast between this Salish Sea that's just full of life. You know, think about the times when we've had whales swim into False Creek, Burrard Inlet, um, how people are just rushing to the shoreline. You just can't, you can't put a price on that kind of experience, that kind of big biodiversity in, in the city. I want you to think about how you felt when I showed you those pictures today. Um, you know, the, 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 the shots of Seattle or San Francisco or Barcelona, uh, sorry Lance, um, you know, yes, energized, but we stressed out, are we burned out? Do we need places to restore, to replenish, to feel nourished? Think about how you felt when you saw those photos. And I think we've all talked about the coming imperative. We're on the bleeding edge of a slow moving catastrophe called climate change and sea level rise. And January 7th was really a wake up call for uh, Vancouver and our approach to the seawall. And I think, you know, we really are going to be asking questions in our upcoming public engagements on the West End waterfront and other parts of the Vancouver as we move into, into a serious conversation around coastal adaptation. So um, I think I just wanna end on all of us thinking about the First Nations principle of reciprocity, of uh, taking care of nature, stewarding nature, and it will take care of us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yo, Spocker, over to you. Uh, unlike my distinguished partner here, I did not prepare a closing statement either, but, um, but I was really interested to hear what uh, those arguing against uh, the motion had to say. And uh, I mean, it's interesting, as I listen to you, I'm not sure that there is a huge difference between what we're saying. I mean, my, my sense is that what's being argued is we need to sort of keep within the limits of the immediate experience of this city and maybe uh, a few years ahead and behind this sense of comfort uh, and uh, the need to avoid noise and uh, I, I, I actually think that uh, um, I, I don't think what we're arguing for is distraction and for me what was really difficult in this debate was was the question in fact and what I was attempting to do was to break it open into a larger space uh, that, that I think uh, is important and I just uh, couldn't resist there was a remark that Margot made that uh, I just want you to know I did all this research, the people in my office will tell you, <laughs> what the <laughs> hell is Yost doing, right? And, I, I, and, I, and what I would say is for me, this, and, and I really appreciate this debate because it allowed me to learn an enormous amount uh, and attempt to weave together things that I think we all as citizens of this place need to somehow get our heads around. So. Um, I'm, I was appreciative of the very seductive slides you guys used. I mean, they're very attractive. I didn't close my eyes when you told me to, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think to argue that commercialization equals distraction is the right uh, position to uh, defend uh, the issue. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. For the last Thank words. you, Mr. Moderator. Um, 
uh, Yost, I, uh, I, I was told that there's supposed to be some humor in this, so that's why um, I came uh, out with that one of that don't those comments. That but I will, but I will also say that even though I had um, eye surgery yesterday, I, I, I can still see some of your points are flawed. <laughs> <laughs> That was my, that was, anyways, um, <laughs> what, what, I, what I believe um, is best for the seawall is not necessarily what it should be. Um, but I do think that we need to look at the bigger picture. And all the city policies that support my and Dave's position in this argument, most of them are dealing with a healthy city and what makes a healthy city. And, if, if, if not then, let the, the people decide and those who use the seawall daily. Um, with sea level rise, a more natural approach will have to be implemented and the amazing wall and space around it will inevitably be modified. The Vancouver seawall is a 28 kilometer long linear amazing park. It is not a sea, just a seawall, it is a park and it is unbe unbelievably unique, special, and at times even magical, and part of Vancouver's identity. If you are going to change anything, make it less commercial and more park-like. And in the end, I will say, what would Jane Jacobs do? <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. Sorry, who? <laughs> So now our panel pro and con get to rest and it's back to you to make a decision, to decide pro or con. What I don't want you to do is to buy into the thing that they're actually saying the same thing. I want you to, le to, to lean into the idea that they're saying very different things and vote with your heart and your consciences and your mind on what of those two options do you think is the best? Commercialize the seawall or not commercialize the seawall? Here is the site to make your vote. If you want to vote by hand, there are some hard ballots. If you're online, please use the site to vote. Here she comes, we have some results. The first vote was 27 to 73, you will recall. The second vote, pros, 39%. Wow. Cons, 61%. There are actually two winners tonight. The official winner are the pros with a 12% gain, a 12% gain. Good guy. We have to give them. But the other winner is also the cons because we still have a great majority who support the con argument. And that is the way of Vancouver. In the end, we all win. <laughs> So Rebecca now is, uh, is giving out the award. <laughs> I'm pleased to tell you that the winners get the Smart City Trophy, which was designed by Richard Enriquez and Ian Grass at Rethink. Oh. That is worth a fortune. We love that. And the other side is given a fantastic <laughs> Urbanarium t-shirt and our undying appreciation. Wow, that was really a good debate. It was really interesting, it was deep, it was fascinating, and it got our minds and I think our hearts around the real question of the quality of life of our city.